Yeah. So now obviously we'll see, I'm gonna grab that leash and pull her away from that. I wanna see what she does when I do that, obviously. So a lot of times that is where you'll see it really build up, right? When we're physically pulling them away from a trigger, that's where it goes from like zero to 60. So basically the general idea behind working through reactivity is we wanna get the dog to consciously make those decisions so we're not needing to physically micromanage them so much, right? I talk about, you know, with barriers and stuff, whether it's a leash or a window or a fence or anything that causes a lot of reactivity, I basically, you know, obviously they're necessary things, leashes and fences, but I wanna make them obsolete from the standpoint of I don't need this thing to get her to disengage from that fence, or I don't need that gate there to get her to not go into that other area, et cetera, et cetera, right? So fill me in here. What are some of our goals with both her as well as yourself we're trying to accomplish, yeah. obviously? So with her, so she has um, like almost like foam at your mouth, dog reactivity on yeah. leash. Um, and, and when I fostered her, she was, we lived in a condo. Yeah. So it was like less than ideal. I mean, mm -hmm. by the 30-story condo and how many times you'll see a dog opening yeah. um, those elevator doors. Now she lives in like a suburb, um, but her reactivity hasn't gotten any better. Yeah. So they just, who is her owner, tried, um, it was like, she mentioned in the form, it was like some sort of like obedience-esque yeah. training. And uh, the most recent thing was, there was most, a lot of redirection. Um, and the most like recent piece of feedback, I guess, when she was still working with the trainer was like, if you see a lot of dogs and off-leash dogs on your roof, when she walks her, you gotta like change your route. Because, yeah. Like, there's no option to change your route. That's the only yeah. route. Uh, so that's not a. Is that the, there's a lot of off leash dogs and stuff in that area? Yeah. Um, she has been, been rushed once or twice. Yeah. Um, off leash dogs. So her goal is to just get her to walk well. Yeah. Um, the tricky part is that she, so when she was rescued, she had ideas and stuff of like, she probably just kept on a rope for a really long time. She yeah, you mentioned that. Um, yeah. Like, like probably like a couple centimeters. Mm -hmm. And then she had a, a collapse trachea, or almost a collapse trachea when, yeah. when uh, she was just adopted. And we were using the bottom at that point. Um, it's not um, so the goal for, for her is, yeah, is just to, is just to be able to walk. Ideally, to be able to socialize with other dogs too, that'd be great. Like off leash. Sure. Um, but that, that's Has she ever actually played with another dog before? So I have footage of her on a really loose leash um, at the shelter, yeah. interacting with other dogs, and she seems fine. Okay. So I'm not sure why it was. Um, and for me, I, I just wanted to go through the process with her. Yeah, um, sure. I, I haven't like learned like a full end-to-end -end color. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so you can just drop your leash if you want. Um, so as far as, again, personal goals on your end, you want to go through a program, obviously, just kind of see how it goes and stuff. Are, uh, remind me, are you, so are you, are you trying to get into training? Or are you just trying to improve your handling skills for the rescues and stuff? That's kind of it? Okay, I got you. All right. Well, what we'll do today is we're going to kind of treat today like a big assessment for her. Um, I want to see how she just responds just overall to training stuff, social stuff. We're gonna get her in with some other dogs right away today. I wanna see how she does with that. Um, I'm just kinda make the call on what we, what direction we're gonna need to go over these next uh, handful of sessions that we have. Has she worn the muzzle before? She has. Is she pretty comfortable with it? Yeah. Perfect. She hasn't worn it in a while, but I think uh, just started mm -hmm. her on it relatively recently before this. Okay. Um, so, you know, just from a general, like, first impression standpoint, right? So, like, she's really hyperactive, you could tell, right? Like, just how you got her out of the car, it's just that spring-loaded energy, of, like, here, 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 right? Um, and those are always, like, the most reactive dogs that we see, and it's, like, not even from, like, an aggression standpoint, it's just they're so freaking wound up all the time, and, like, such as ball of energy, you put the single iota of, like, restraint on them, and it just explodes, you know what I mean? Um, 
the, the positive here, right, is once we drop that leash, like there's obviously another dog there. There's a lot of energy and stuff going on over there and she doesn't seem super interested in it. You know what I mean? Um, so sometimes we'll see reactivity that isn't even necessarily like geared towards a specific thing. Like it can be triggered by a dog or triggered by a person or whatever it may be, but it's just like general reactivity. You know what I mean? She just has like a reactive nervous system that just like explodes at things, right? Um, so we'll see obviously as she kind of starts to explore her way over there what she does. Um, but so far that's actually a positive because that means when we remove the restraint, she may still be jumpy and stuff, but she's not like seeking out conflict towards a specific trigger. So again, we'll see what she does once she's here, but. All right, give her one more minute. And we're actually gonna, we're gonna start with some of the social stuff with her. I wanna just, well, we'll once we get over there, because we're gonna take her over there for it, um, we'll pop it on once we get over there. Yeah. So now obviously we'll see, I'm gonna grab that leash and pull her away from that. I wanna see what she does when I do that, obviously. So a lot of times that is where you'll see it really build up, right? When we're physically pulling them away from a trigger, that's where it goes from like zero to 60. So basically the general idea behind working through reactivity is we wanna get the dog to consciously make those decisions so we're not needing to physically micromanage them so much, right? I talk about, you know, with barriers and stuff, whether it's a leash or a window or a fence or anything that causes a lot of reactivity, I basically, you know, obviously they're necessary things, leashes and fences, but I wanna make them obsolete from the standpoint of I don't need this thing to get her to disengage from that fence, or I don't need that gate there to get her to not go into that other area, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, okay, we're gonna take her back over this way. This is one of those things that I think, you know, getting to like rescues and stuff, like more of your side of things of like helping rescue dogs. I think that a lot of people don't give dogs fair assessments as far as their social skills because the reactive dogs, because we don't have control over them, we try to do the interaction on leash, which just makes it worse and just makes them look scarier, right? Nine out of 10 times when we get dogs that come in from owners that say, my dog's dog aggressive, they're really just reactive and once we throw them in a social, they're perfectly fine, right? Now, it's not always the case, obviously, yeah. but um, our initial assessment has to be done in a way where the dog can express themselves in their truest self, yeah. you know? Meaning it's gotta be off leash, yeah. right? And obviously we need to be safe about it, that's why we use muzzles, right? Um, but it's gotta be done in that off leash setting. And with a- To care less more about the person. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And in most of these cases, right, if we could just get these dogs a couple of friends, it's funny how we see that like immediately relate to their reactivity because dogs become less novel when they're out and about. Right. Now you gotta be careful with obviously um, the, those really like hyperactive dogs. It's not even that it's aggression, but like they could get triggered easily by things and just go into this frenzy that could start fights. Yeah. But it's typically not, again, geared towards the dog. Like I'm trying to attack the dog, yeah. you know? So they are... Yes. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Past that, obviously. Understanding noises and stuff is very, very important, right? Like right there, she'll have that little weird, call it a grumble, call it a growl, call it whatever you want to call it. Some dogs are just noisy, right? Like Vinny, my Malinois, like he is a noisy freaking dog, right? He makes all sorts of weird noises. You'll be petting him sometimes and he likes it and he's like, you know? Sometimes he's playing with other dogs, he grumbles and growls, but knowing the dog that you're working with, right? Knowing him, that growl doesn't turn into him trying to attack the other dog ever. It's just his way of expressing himself. Now again, every dog's a little different with it, but as we're assessing the dog, we need to figure those things out. This is great. She's, her body language is so much softer than, yep. than on leash. Like even on leash, like mm -hmm. the other dog, she's just looking for it. Yeah. She's outside sometimes. Mm -hmm. so this morning when we went for a walk, so I can get a chance to see sure. it. Sure. How do you balance uh, the dog? And I have a friend who has a dog who's like mostly kitty, mm -hmm. and she comes out Yeah. And how do you how do you balance dogs working having a balance dog help that dog to learn how to be less hot yeah. without putting too much sure. of a negative influence on that other dog to, to 
No, that's a good, I understand what you're asking. So there's, there's a couple of dynamics to that question. So first and foremost, we have to understand we're not gonna change who the dog is, sure. right? A high strung, wound up dog is always going to be a high strung, wound up dog. That dog may be able to be a controlled, high strung, wound up dog, but they're always gonna be like that to some extent, right? Um, so we need to look at then, let's say we're taking a dog that's really high energy and we're letting them in the group, right? And they come in with a lot of energy, but they're not really doing anything wrong. They're just at like a level 10, yep. right? And another dog comes over and attacks that dog over it, let's say hypothetically, sure. right? A lot of times we look at it from the lens of almost kind of how you're asking of, well, how do I decrease the energy of that dog to prevent that dog from attacking it? When in actuality, it's the other dog's issue. You know what I mean? Now, let's say the dog is high energy and wound up and jumping all over, you know, let's say I let this dog out and this dog was crazy and ran over to you and started jumping all over you, yeah. right? That's a different story, right? And then a dog came over and attacked her, right? That's that dog disciplining that dog for an unstable energy, right? Doing something with it, you know what I mean? <clears throat> this is great. I know you, I know you. And again, things like this, right? This is really important to see these things because a lot of people that don't understand dogs will look at that and be like, oh my God, she's trying to bite him, right? right? That's absolutely not at all what that was, right? Like, that was her communicating a boundary, right. right? This dog started coming in hot, like you were just saying, right? And she said, hey, I don't like that, right? And I don't want to take away the dog's ability to communicate these types of yeah. things. If anything, I want to let them know, yes, you can do that. Yeah. You just don't need to do it so intensely right. if it was really intense, right? It'll be respected. Exactly. So exactly. Um, I've heard from the training world. Sure. Some people don't like to correct dogs while they're socializing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the age old, like, oh, well, like, let's say I, because these dogs all have e collars on, obviously. Let's say I, I corrected that dog with an e collar near her. A lot of people will say, oh, well, isn't she going to develop this association that the dog did that, yes. right? That just comes down to how much groundwork are we putting in before we start the correction, right? We, when we give corrections with anything, we always attach them to ourselves first and foremost. We always attach corrections first and foremost to us, right? So anytime I deliver a consequence for a behavior, I'm always utilizing a marker with that, right? So you hear markers commonly used with positive, right? A clicker, a yes mark, something like that, that attaches, hey, that thing you're doing is what this reward is for. They work equally with, with punishment, obviously, right? So if I'm gonna give a correction for something, I would identify that mistake with no, that would let the dog know, right? That thing you're doing right there is incorrect. Additionally, it lets them know this correction is about to come from me, right? So I don't run the risk of them having this superstitious association with the other dog because this correction came out of thin air, right? right? It didn't, right? I clearly identified the thing they were doing and that wasn't just the dog, right? It was the behavior you were exhibiting when you were near the dog. And additionally, right, it preps them for something is about to happen now. Right. Now, obviously, you know, you get into, is it still possible to develop like a temporary superstitious association? Like, yes, you know what I mean? Like, let's say, you know, obviously we're doing a condensed program with her, right? We're doing it over the course of a week as opposed to 10 weeks, right? So we're not gonna have enough, as much time to be like, well, we're gonna spend an entire week conditioning our markers yep. in and this and that, right? So, you know, there's gonna be a time, I'm sure at some point when I do need to give her a correction for something that no marker hasn't fully been conditioned in. And she may for a split second be like, wait a minute, I don't know where that came from, right? right? She may say, you know, I I don't know where that came from, right? But through a handful of repetitions of that and through me not removing her from the situation and then her going near the dog and it not happening again and stuff like that, she'll quickly start to put it together. You know what I mean? I think sometimes we look at dogs like they're dumber than they are. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they can figure this stuff out way better than we think a lot. This is great though. Again, I'm seeing nothing concerning here. I haven't seen a single thing that I'm worried about. If anything, again, this is the kind of stuff that this dog really needs, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's hard to find both, I think, yeah. the They just weren't sure what sure. would happen. 100%. Right? So it's like, and you don't want to be willy-nilly about it, obviously. Yeah. We have to know and trust the dogs, at least initially, as we're gauging through this stuff. And again, I don't get crazy about the like, oh, she's doing the head over the back or anything like that. But you do want to monitor those things because it does put the dog in a vulnerable position sometimes. Let's say, 
Uh, yes, yeah. right? Because let's say he's laying down, right? She's got head over the shoulders, right? And she's really examining. She's not doing anything wrong necessarily, but then he gets up real quick. And because she's hyperactive, her instinct goes to grab right? It could create a problem, right? So I'm not going to stop it necessarily, but I do want to monitor it closely knowing it's a vulnerable spot. And then additionally, as he puts pressure on her like that, right? He gets a little bit more dominant and stuff with her. I want to watch how she responds to that. So those are all the things I look for when I'm doing an assessment like this. And if it's too much or she responds, mm -hmm. are you like, it's not a good fit? Not necessarily, right? I would I would look at what is the problem, right? Let's say he started getting really, really pushy with her again and she got off put by that and let out a little snap or something like she did before, yeah. right? Um, that's not a bad thing. Then I would look at how does he respond to that, right. right? Does he respect that cue, right? If he doesn't, I, you know, depending on, you know, how intense of a response it was, I may let it slide a little more. If it persists and he keeps pushing and amping himself up every time she does that, right. um, I would then step in and I would correct him for that. I would let him know, hey, you got to back off when she starts giving you those signs. You know, for the most part, I want to let the dogs figure a lot of this stuff out on their own. And I want to be there to help mitigate problems if I notice they continue to escalate. So we just have to, we just have to identify which dog is being the problem in that moment and how do I need to resolve that situation. On the contrary, there's some dogs that are like fearful dogs, right? That they'll go park themselves in a corner over there, right? And they won't do anything. And other dogs will walk near them or go up to them, they'll err, like let out a little grumble or growl or something like that. And you know, even though that dog is saying they're uncomfortable in that moment, I need to allow the dogs to push on that a little bit to help get them out of their shell sometimes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Trying to you know, get all the dogs who are either dog aggressive or under socialized or whatever out of their shell. Is there any consequence to exposing that dog to so many? Good question. Yeah. yeah um, I think you have to be mindful of the situations you're putting them in, right? So, like, if every single, let's say he was my demo dog, right? He's the one I pull out every time I want to test another dog. And every single time that happens, that other dog goes after him, right? You know, if he's really stable, he'll be fine. But if it continues to happen every single time, he's going to start getting a little apprehensive about coming into those socials. So you just have to balance it out a little bit, which is why, you know, we have access to so many dogs. I don't have to put my one dog in that position every single time, right? Because I also think equally, right, we had somebody comment on a post about him, right, the dog I was referring to in from Colorado, day one, didn't go after him, but like kind of snapped in his face a little bit. He got a little wigged out from it and stuff. And they were like, oh my God, that's you're putting him in this vulnerable position stuff like that we also don't want to hold our dogs back from the realities of what happens in the world right it's important for them to learn what to do when they're encountered with those situations right fight or flight right we need them to understand you know safety and danger like all of those types of things and that's all important things for them to be exposed to we just have to moderate how much it's happening it's, it's the same deal with like stress right a lot of people try to avoid stress at all costs in training, yeah. right? Stress is not this bad thing, right? Like when I learn new things, I get a little stressed out from it. And moderate stress is good for a dog, right? It's good for them to learn through. Now, this is another exactly what I was talking about, right? Kind of vulnerable position. She was over top of him. He's kind of kicking at her and stuff. So I need to see how she responds to those things. And again, she's doing very well with it, right? Um, but yeah, stress, you know, moderately is good, but we have to make sure everything isn't super stressful all the time. So we don't want our dogs to exist forever in this state of stress, you know? If anything, if stress is happening, we need to hit a point where they've overcome that hurdle and that stress, they be successful with it, and then, Theo, cut it out. And then become confident through that before we encounter the next stressor then at that point. Yeah, I had a, my most recent foster that adopted, uh, he had fear aggression and, sure. and had just a really low threshold. So yeah. the stress thing was basically we just sure. worked out the stress levels. That's just it, right? Like a lot of those dogs, when we get these like massively fearful dogs in, some of the best things we do is incrementally put them in situations that they're scared of and teach them, okay, nothing bad happened. Now we move on to the next one. Nothing bad happened, you know? This is great. Give her a couple more minutes here. We're starting off strong. 
So like if I get a new client in or something that has like a really reactive dog or dog aggressive dog or anything like that, sometimes by starting with the social and showing them, hey, this is who your dog is, right? It could at least temper it like these owners, right? Like it's not like you're gonna go home and she's just gonna be perfect for them, right? Like they're not even here to learn half of the yeah. stuff, right? Watch all the videos. Yes. But them being able to see just first and foremost, like, oh my God, like she can play, right? <laughs> like she's clearly not an aggressive dog. That could just for an owner be such a relief where if they don't get past anything else, but they know their dog can socialize with other dogs, it's like, all right, well, that's a huge hurdle. So I try to go for those like little wins for people and just like stack those up a little yeah. bit at a time, you know? Yeah, like barking. What's that? Are they usually, if, if that burst of energy triggers another dog, what does that look like? Yeah, so it could be a couple things. It could be running over barking, right? It could be, that could trigger dogs to go and like bite. Yeah. Um, it just depends, so. But that's an example of a dog coming in hot, right? right? And it's not a problem, right? If you have balanced dogs, they're gonna receive that energy pretty yeah. well, so. If you have a dog that barks and plays police, do you bark them? It depends, okay. right? Again, you know, so, so for example, the dog in from Colorado, that's kind of what he did, right? So he would run over and like, kind of snap bark, right? He would like snap, snap, yep. right? Yep. That obviously would be an inappropriate behavior, right? That's a really controlling behavior. Some dogs just wanna be a part of it and just run over and start barking like, hey, I'm here, right? right? Again, that I don't necessarily have as much of a problem with. So it's, it's very, all these things are very dog dependent. And as you work with more dogs, right, and you socialize more dogs, you'll start to notice patterns in their behavior, right? Like, so her, for example, we've seen so many, like as soon as you brought her out of the car, right? I've seen so many dogs with that same energy at this point that I kind of know how they're gonna respond when we put them into this, you know? Yeah.